năm bốn ba hai một drop Welcome to the Third Culture Kid podcast. I'm Chris, one half of the Ranting Bananas, based in Bangkok. I'm half Vietnamese, half Chinese, born and bred in England. Today we have Mike, an old university friend, joining us from Zambia. Apologies in advance for the shitty audio. Promise the next episode will be better. Enjoy the podcast, guys. When was the last time we saw each other? Yeah, dude, we saw each other. I think that was in 2000 and wait, when you moved out of Portsmouth, actually, that was the last time I saw you. Must have been 2010. So yeah, that was like 10 years ago. And yeah, you, uh, I think you went back to Surrey, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. I finished uni in like 2012 and worked in Portsmouth for like a couple of years in like um, a web design company, but I was actually the graphic designer. And I worked on video content for, for the company. So then after that, I kind of said, okay, you know what? I need to change uh, my environment because I'm someone that does not like to stay in the same place for like for a long time. I like to look at things from a different perspective, learn new things. So I moved to Zambia where I think I contacted you when I was down here, when I was trying to start up that digital marketing company. Uh, the reason why we did not advance was obviously financially we weren't we weren't like highly prepped and then what we discovered later on was that over here you need to know people like it's not about what you know it's about who you know so you might go to a company you might say okay you're a startup and you would like to pitch to them an idea to have let's say a whole digital campaign so you want to do their social media you want to do their websites at the end of the day if you don't know anyone you're not going to get any, anywhere. You're actually not going to go far. So you actually first need to connect with a lot of people. Um, because at the end of the day, I've seen some pretty mediocre work. But just because you know someone, it's it's fine. But, you know, it's, yeah, anyway, yeah. That's so true in Asia as well, man. Like, it's everything is about establishing a good rapport and a relationship and then business comes after. Even, like, a lot of these business meetings in different companies are just... Let's go out for drinks and get really fucking yeah. weird and then talk about, and then like if I like you, then we'll talk <laughs> about proposal and you're like, what the fuck? Luckily I haven't been in any of those. Uh, it's it's been quite a international environment I got myself in. But I hear like a lot of like Japanese companies do it, Korean companies do it. Vietnamese companies do it. I'm guessing Thai might do it, but because it's quite religious over here, so um, maybe that's not as prevalent. Yeah, lo- lots of Asian countries are, are are still still doing business like that, which is um, different, right? Very different. Yeah, it is it is different. I mean, I think in in a way it's it's good because you have to know who you're going to be getting into business with. Um, their consistency, their personality. At the end of the day, I wouldn't. I mean, well, look. In the capitalist way of thinking, you know, money is just money. You know, you do the job and that's it. But then I think um, in certain areas like like you've mentioned, Asia and here, spending money is a bit of a risk. Like you need to know who you're paying. And I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, no, no. I agree, man. Like a lot of business is from word of mouth over here. And it's like the people you've worked with, the people you trust. So you care more about that reputation. Sometimes I think a lot of that could be like fate or like people trying to blow up their reputation, right? So there's yeah. good and bad of, of both, but you're quite right. Like even if you're not the best agency for the job, at least you have this working rapport, at least you trust each other, you know? So it, th- I think there's uh, pros and cons of both. I'm also getting used to it because I haven't really done much of that stuff, but it, I think it's fun. I think it's very fun indeed to just think about. Yeah, it is, it is. Uh, so anyway, so you mentioned Thailand is a bit of a religious country and, you know, it's not the same. So what, you don't get wasted in Thailand? <laughs> oh, mate, I get fucking wasted. Don't worry about that. No, no. It's like really Buddhist, right? So like the king has to be a monk for a certain time of his life. You know, like the, yeah, even the royal family will have to do their, you know, pay their dues in terms of paying respect to the religion. And it's, it's yeah, it's very heavily Buddhist. But saying that, they don't stick to the rules of, like, traditional Buddhism, where there's, like, no meat, give up worldly possessions and all that stuff. But, yes, 
last Saturday was a religious holiday, so they banned selling alcohol for 24 hours. You can't get it. It's part of the law. Yeah, Thailand is interesting that because I've never lived in such a you know religious country. You know, I've never lived in the Middle East, for example, so I, I don't know what it's like. But it's religious uh, to an extent. People are still very sort of uh, they they still go to temples and there's these like big festivals and stuff. It's quite cool. But I think Buddhism is one of the more like relaxed religious. Yes, yes. You know, I, was, I, was, I was just about to say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not crazy, like, um, and you know, Thailand is also the sin city of Asia. There's a lot <laughs> of like, sex tourism. It's crazy, man. Like, and it's like they're not even shy about it. You know, it's just like yeah. advertised. Everybody knows, and also it's very progressive in the transgender community and the gay community. Like, right. nobody gives a fuck, basically, right? Uh, yeah. Which is great, and they didn't like. You know, there wasn't big marches and stuff. I mean, I think the gay pride here, uh, I don't think there is a gay pride because it has been so accepted. And this is what I've heard from some friends. I'm not sure if it's true. I need to fact check it. But one of like the gods in Thailand previously was a man and then he sort of transcended and, and became a woman, right? So imagine growing up with a culture, something like that, and then uh, for people to do you know exactly the same, or, or to even, you know, be gender fluid is actually quite natural and there's nothing wrong with it. So, like, people here are just, you know, it's not even discussed because it's not one of those topics that are like, oh, my God, it's a red flag. Um, so it's very common that, it, you know. So, yeah, in lots of respect, Thailand is very uh, progressive. Like, digitally now, it's becoming a bit more with this whole Thailand 4.0 initiative where they want to take all banking and government systems online to get rid of the manual paperwork and stuff very cool okay very very cool okay okay so that that's very interesting because um i was actually like i i forgot to mention when when i tried to establish the digital market, it did not go well um i ended up working a couple of jobs before i landed the one that i actually have and the one that i actually have i was hired through a project Because the company was looking to implement an ERP system. And I had the vision to say, okay, yes, we have to implement this because everything is manual. And like everything in Zambia, like, you know, you go to certain uh, companies, everything is still done manually. And you wonder, there's actually no control. Now, the government doesn't have control of those businesses because like you can easily lose paperwork and like it's not really accurate. So... Getting involved in that project kind of landed me to where I am today with the company because we successfully implemented the ERP system. It was a huge challenge because we had to deal with like stakeholders that were very resistant to the introduction because let's say they're all old school people that have been dealing with manual documentation for like, you know, for like let's say 15 years. And then here you are, a new guy saying, OK, look, we're going to make everything elect- electronic. First of all, they have no experience and they, so, they, so they're scared. Automatically, they get scared. They're like, okay, what's going to happen? I'm going to lose my job. But then what we tried to emphasize and like, you know, make them feel comfortable about was they would still retain their jobs because um, we would provide training. And to have like your, your information digitally stored is like, you know, it, it's got great benefits. So I'm very surprised that you're telling me that Thailand is still using manual <laughs> manual processes. That's crazy. Oh, man, like applying for like a visa and stuff you have to like physically sign like shit loads of paperwork like every single side of the contract or whatever it is you have to sign it just to make sure and yeah it's it's very it's slower but vietnam is definitely more manual um but thailand actually their banking system is actually quite innovative if you have a phone number i can just directly pay you like and it takes one second and it's yeah, like same, same. you know yeah yeah but that's the thing with digital transformation, right? Like people are, you know, afraid they might lose their jobs because things are getting automated. But actually, it'll make them more effective and more efficient, right? In lots exactly. of ways, it is scary, definitely. So I want, dude, you mentioned so many interesting things, right? Like, let me dive into like, okay, so you were doing like multimedia at university. Yes. Uh... Look, yeah, multimedia, but then you have to break that down because, yeah, it was in different aspects. So you've got web design, video production, game production, uh, interface design, project management. 
<laughs> and music production and film as well. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember you making a film. So like you did all of that at uni, and then you're like, okay, went for this web design agency, got a graphic design job, and then now, like you said, you mentioned, you know, SQL, and then you know, uh, ERP systems. It's like you've done so much from the last time I saw you because we literally haven't spoke in like ten years. Tell me about that journey. Like what happened, and like what happened throughout that. Okay, so um. You know, when, when I got the job to work in ERP, because I already had prior experience to designing websites, a website and ERP, two things that they have in common is, let's say, an interface, okay, and, and like data, data accessing. So uh, the fact that I also had the knowledge on like information design, my, my main, um, let's say, core competency was to understand the flow of information and how people can um, inter interrelate manual and digital. So everything that's on manual needs to be similar. The input has to be similar on the digital. So you don't have the, to make the forms too complicated. You actually have to make things more, uh, let's say shorter or like quicker to access. So yeah, as a creative, um, you, you've got knowledge of the whole- It sounds yes. like you're a UX designer, yeah. Like, okay, the word UX designer, I think that came after my graduation. So it's kind of like a new thing and I haven't really explored it. <laughs> but uh, in my days, we called it in, uh, interface design, right? Or, yeah, information design, so to say. With my web knowledge, I was able to ace that. But then I had to undergo a lot of training and a lot of um, tutorials to learn how to actually consolidate data. So I had to move now from the actual design to actually dealing and manipulating uh, data. That led me to now start learning SQL and let's say other uh, DBMS, uh, database management systems. Um, it's been a lot of learning and I have so much content in my head sometimes and I ask myself like, okay, where do I fit in? What do I call myself? Because I'm, I'm like a chimera that's evolved with like different, like, you know, one hand can touch on like web, the other hand can touch on like uh, data analysis, for example. I'm pretty well versed now, but I'm, I'm currently trying to get a certification so I can like specialize um, solely in like business intelligence and like eventually do artificial intelligence as well, because I think that that's where I found my passion. The web, the filming, the graphic design. OK, that's for me, that's a bit like basic now. And it's, it's so worldwide, it's so um, condensed, uh, it's saturated because now you've even got like softwares that you can just pay and they design the, the it, it automatically designs the website for you with just the information that you put in, in certain fields and certain criteria. And that's the same that's happening with, with certain uh, graphic design um, uh, softwares like online you can go and let's say go to picto chart for example and create a whole powerpoint using templates that they already have for you with just you know for just a small fee now when when you're dealing in business or if you're a manager that is faster for you because it saves you time from having to learn how to design and then you know doing everything from scratch or maybe employing someone to do it for you like i found that in in you know certain companies it's it's, it's quite beneficial because you know, you save time, you just, you know, drag and drop and you create your presentation there or you design a little animation uh, on the go. So I think that's kind of taking over as well. When you said Picto Chart, so funny because um, I actually applied for them two years ago. Yeah, they had a role in Malaysia. So they're based in Malaysia, uh, a little place called Penang. So I found yeah. out about them and I, yeah, like the application process was quite funny. You have to record like a one minute video introducing yourself and do a bunch of other stuff, but that's really funny. Okay, cool. <laughs> sure. yeah. That was the example you came with. It's like, okay, very interesting. So, okay, um, let me try and unpack what you said because I, I think there's a lot of little nuggets in there. Yeah, you're quite right in terms of design. Lots of like things are getting automated now and people are becoming more sort of design fluent uh, and there's softwares out there that replace it, you know, your Squarespace or even like WordPress, the CMS could, yeah, could be displayed on the front end in so many different ways. So you want to get into BI, uh, data engineering, eventually like machine learning, right? 
Yeah, the the reason the reason I'm saying that is obviously like once we installed the ERP system and everything, I was put in charge of uh, monitoring how much the company is spending and how much the company is like making from sales. So you've got your purchases, you've got your sales. Uh, how much stock do we have in each store? Because we've got like five stores across the country. So all that. Um, all that information, the input was stored or is stored in databases in the system. So usually like one of my day-to-day tasks is to extract that information and create reports for my director. So creating those reports in, in a sense, that's, you know, data analysis, basically. So, you know, you're making visualizations and and dashboards for your director to kind of go through and, and see how his, his business is performing. Um, that has been, uh, I, w- I wouldn't say self-taught. It's been like a criteria for my job, and I've evolved into that. And I'm, you know, I've gotten to a stage where I feel okay. I'd like to work, let's say, for a much higher company with like different data to play with, for example. Because like right now, I feel like okay, I've I've played on the same field for a long time, and it's the same reports over and over again. And I feel like I need to move now to try and work with bigger data, for example. Because right now, I'm still working with with small data and I don't think it's big and it's it's not on the level where you can actually apply um, like machine learning for example and all that like it's 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 still in, in the very basic levels. What are you guys using like SAP or like Oracle or are you like um, making your own system? Uh, okay so we've got we've actually got a third party that designed the system using Oracle. Oh all right anybody that likes data wants a bigger data set right because you can like manipulate it in so many different ways provide lots of insights and there's one thing that's very interesting um about data driven decisions anyway so there's a guy from google that came to our office the other day and he gave a he gave a really good talk and we basically sent him a bunch of questions he's based in singapore and how he does it is he always looks at the data first in order to find a design problem and then build experiments and solve that. So there's a bunch of stuff that actually we are doing with our data. Right now, it's not that sophisticated. It's just say, like tracking, you know, like MAU or performance issues, you know, like just very basic stuff. But eventually you could dive into like the ROI of your feature, you know, where where the drop-offs are, and then you can kind of like make your product better, right? Or more effective, which is really cool, right? I mean, yeah, that, that's that's really cool, and, and that's 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 what I'm talking about. Like what you've just mentioned there, we haven't even gotten to that level yet because we're still deciding on how to use our um, RFM methodology for our customer relation management. For example, um, we've got customer data, but then the input is wrong, so we need to retrain our stuff, or we need to redesign the system in a way such that it captures the names. Now, there's also a lot of internal debate because the director does not want names because of this, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of internal politics, but (laughs) at the end of the day, like you do find uh, internal politics influencing and affecting the development of of, uh, systems as well um, when when it's not that that liberal. Yeah. So what kind of company is your company? I'm guessing you work in the tech department, but what uh, what does your company do? Yeah, okay, so the company is quite diverse, but I'm, I'm actually working in the retail field, so we sell, like, hardware. It's the largest hardware-selling company in, in Zambia. Yeah, for, like, home users and contractors, because, as you know, um, Zambia is very... It's, it's a growing economy, and there's a lot of construction going on, so we supply a lot of projects. So you've got army projects, um, NGO projects, uh, local government projects, so yeah, there's there's a lot of we, we supply all the all the tools, um, plumbing material and, and everything, and some machinery as well, like generators, concrete mixers, and and all that. So we have at least about eighteen thousand line items, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you guys must have a massive warehouse. Yeah, yeah, we've got two massive warehouses. Yeah, and then each store carries. Um, like a mini warehouse where they can store goods because we don't set centralize everything what we do is we have like a central warehouse where we receive all the shipment from like let's say china dubai and south africa we clear it um into like at that central warehouse and then we dispatch it to different stores but of course the stores have to request 
and this is what the system kind of helped us with it, it helped us see what's selling more in whichever store so like the rate of sale of, of sale for an item for example so then the stores have to request their highest uh, uh, selling items and that's what we sent to them as a priority and then everything else comes later but yeah it's it's interesting bro it's interesting do you see yourself staying in zambia for like long term uh to be honest with you i've never ever felt like being in any place long term um i think we're still young while we're young we we have you know while we have the chance to learn and have different experiences meet different people around the world i think that's more of uh yeah i wouldn't think that i'm gonna stay here for a while so my mindset is to say i need to see things from a di- from different perspectives as much as i can uh, i've been to europe i've been to america before i've never been to asia um zambia okay it's it's okay but it's it's a place where you might consider settling down because everything is so like chilled here and laid back but i still have the energy in me and i'm not some old fart that just needs to like retire so i don't think i'm gonna stay here <laughs> longer so i'm thinking of like moving to asia or yeah somewhere asia man move to asia please it's it's awesome yeah i just have i just need to like um wait for this whole corona thing to settle down because <laughs> yeah it's uh, even my dad was telling me he's like oh thailand has corona i was like no i was watching a video on youtube and it was posted last week and everything seems fine bangkok is safe <laughs> yeah i mean the, now there's like an outbreak in korea um and the chinese got, have been taught to lie about the numbers so it's oh, I, i heard that in the last oh, podcast actually yeah so there's a there's a there's a bunch of things that are happening but you're quite right so sars lasted for about eight months until it really died down and we had a, a hold of it but you know we'll see how long corona is but yeah and also, also you need to sort of prep yourself mentally yes yeah. yes have you thought about um, in asia like, what it be like is it your big sort of metropolitan city like Hong Kong, Singapore, or are you looking for something uh, more more vibrant and maybe with more, how do I say it, uh, more of a vibe, like more kind of developing so you get that hustle and bustle feel? Um, so then my dream was actually to go to Thailand. This is like in 2015. I told myself I'm going to move to Thailand, visit all the Buddhist temples, because I actually developed an interest in like learning um, a few theories in Buddhism and like a few, uh, I read a few scholar articles. I think they're very open-minded, they're very calm. Like I think other areas of Asia seem to have a lot of social, um, social, I wouldn't call them problems, but like uh, requirements, so to say. <laughs> Like Japan, obviously the language is a barrier. You need to learn Japanese. China, the same thing. Uh, Vietnam, I'm sure you need to like learn Cantonese and stuff. But I think Thailand has, um, Hong Kong and Singapore actually have high numbers of like expats and stuff. So I would fit in perfectly. But I think we'll start off with uh, with Thailand and then see what Singapore and Hong Kong are saying later. Yeah, that makes sense. So like Hong Kong and Singapore are very, like, you know, uh it's like singapore's national language is english right so you have no problem speaking to anybody in singapore hong kong used to be a british colony that's also fine right everybody's english fluency would be great and those on the surface they are very western I- I- inherently right singapore more so uh, because it's yeah, so yeah. new and then when you dive into hong kong yes it's like very western uh actually very british as well Uh, but then when you dive into some of these little corners, you do find like the the charm of of, of Hong Kongese people. Um, but Bangkok is a very very interesting mix of both worlds. So uh, it has a very distinctive Asian feel and Thai feel specifically. But it is has all the conveniences of you know Western life. Like for example, public transportation. You know it's great to just get around. And there's actually a huge number of, you know, migrant workers, be it speaking English or or not. So there's like, you know, like Filip- Philippines workers, uh, uh, Myanmar workers, but also there's a lot of British that 
have retired here. So it's actually a, a healthy mix. And you, I don't think culture shock wise, it's like as much as maybe some more uh, emerging markets like Vietnam uh, yeah. or Indonesia. So it's actually a very good place to sort of start off. And you can either go to either part of the spectrum, right? Very developed or more comfortable or just like super ghetto like Cambodia, uh, which is also amazing because like, yeah, it also has its own sort of feel, right? It's so different. And yeah, like, you know, you see a lot more of the countryside, which is also super nice. Uh, But yeah, no, I would definitely recommend this part of the world, Southeast Asia. Also, it's kind of like, imagine you living a landmass in, you know, Europe somewhere where like you're bordering so many countries. So you can go anywhere for a weekend, right? Thailand also has a sort of, you know, you can fly to Vietnam within an hour, uh, Singapore in a couple of hours. So it's like, it's a great way. It's a great gateway because Bangkok Airport is also a hub to for you to get out and, and, and touch all these other cultures and, and, and people and, and see a bunch of things. So it's cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. To, uh, Asia is like, is very nice to explore. Like I've always loved everything. Like I feel um, growing up, I did watch like a lot of Japanese and Chinese programs. And just recently, I think the past eight years I've been binging on Korean stuff. So I really like the innovations and like the social aspect of everything. And I think being like you've mentioned, being in a central point where you're able to just like visit these other areas is, is key. So you wouldn't want to land yourself in a place where you feel like spaced out and lost and you have to start from scratch, like language wise, for example, I have a mate of mine that moved to Japan after uni and he found it very difficult. Right now he's in, he's in, he's in Canada just because of the language issue. So if you can be in a place like, like Thailand and be able to, to travel like, you know, to Vietnam or to Hong Kong or to South Korea and, and, and Japan at your convenience and that's fine because these areas obviously you're not going to have to go over there and start from scratch you could have like a base in Thailand where you're kind of comfortable and all set up and then just tour these these areas for like a week or a couple of weeks and yeah no, it's good it's good yeah I always thought you were Asian at heart bro I always knew I always knew <laughs> I was uh, I was Asian in my past life yeah I was Asian in my past <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Whenever the the corona dies down, then uh, let's let's help you plan your move. And uh, yeah, I can also help with apartment hunting or you know or, or whatever, whatever you need, right? I think. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, yeah, I was going to ask you a couple of questions as well, man. What's the weather like there? Have you been there for a year and have you experienced like a whole 365 days of, of season change or is it constant like throughout? What, what's the weather like? Right, right. Okay, so um, this part of Thailand, Bangkok, because we're, we're sort of like, I guess, middle, middle of Bangkok, not quite like south, but it's basically the same weather like in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. So there's basically two seasons, uh, the rainy season, right so uh and then there's just like a really really hot season so there's only two seasons you don't get like autumn or winter right so it's quite nice i would say maybe a bit too hot some days where it's like 38 39 degrees yeah (laughs) yeah it's it's aircon all day it's aircon all day sometimes you don't get it when you're working you're like you know the the subway is like well air, air conditioned right and obviously taxis or whatever, uh, the, yeah. the buildings and malls, like, it, it's fine. You don't really have to deal with it unless you want to deal with it, right? Uh, because That's it's true. like beach weather all the time. You can just, like, go to the fucking beach and be like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I'm on holiday 24-7. <laughs> yeah. Tropical. And then the rainy season is, like, really refreshing because it's like, damn, like, you know, there's more moisture in the air now. And so it doesn't really drop below, I would say... 25 26 degrees ever really wow okay okay that's very interesting because uh we have a similar uh we have similar kind of weather here but i'd i'd break the weather down here because yes you have the hot days and then you've got the rainy season but during june and july you have like a really cold period where temperatures drop uh you don't get any snow or anything the sun's still still out 
but then you do get like really cold days. Does that happen over there or it's just constantly hot? Like, do you have cold days ever? So I experienced this uh, the other day and everybody was like, oh my God, it's like winter. But it was like 21 degrees. Uh, what only? <laughs> yeah, for like three days and everybody's like, shit, I'm so cold. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And people are wearing like winter jackets and I'm like, what? This is really nice. Like just walking out. Like so, yeah. So they have like one week in a year in Bangkok where it ever reaches like low twenties, and then that's considered cold. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that's very interesting, man. That's very interesting. And for the transport systems, like you said, obviously, uh, let's say compared to London, when you working in London, driving is obviously like the most dumbest thing to do because you're going to be stuck in traffic or, you know, you're going to consume a lot of, you know, you're going to have higher cost of, of like travel. Do you think it's much convenient to use public transport as a working professional in Bangkok or you'd rather have your own car? Hands down, man. I would say public transport all the way. So what I did was I rented a bike, like a, like a little scooter when I came here first because yeah. I thought it was like Vietnam because Vietnam has really a bad public transport system you know no subway uh no sky train or nothing like that just buses and for in vietnam it's the main mode of transportation is these little scooters that you just uh buzz around you know like you're a 16 year old you know like thinking you're cool but in, yeah. in bangkok you don't you don't really do that because people have it but if you live like a bit further away you might need it but everything uh is quite well connected i wouldn't say it's as good as London because London, you know, it was the first one and they have multiple lines and it's and it's very good, but it's definitely a lot newer than London, right? So it's not yeah. as like stinky or whatever, right? Like it's yeah. quite well connected. <laughs> yeah, because London fucking underground is disgusting in summer, right? Absolutely disgusting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, no, no it, it's really good. It's not as good as like Taiwan or South Korea in terms of like the metro system, but I see it getting built and extended all the time. So I haven't been here for a year yet. I've only been here for like four months. I pretty much exclusively either use taxis because they're really cheap, or day to day commute. Uh, I just go on the on the BTS, which is the SkyTrain. Okay, okay, nice, nice. And uh, like you said, they, they, they're still building and they're still developing it. Uh, I'm guessing the mind, the mindset of the people that are actually constructing and stuff is to say, right, let's do a good job. Because here in Zambia, for example, um, there is a lot of development. We've got like subcontractors and contractors building roads and infrastructure. But you find that the roads sort of get demolished or damaged after you know a couple of years because they weren't built properly and like is there in 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 thailand is there like a high quality check like you know quality yeah high quality check in in the production and and construction of infrastructure definitely well i can only compare it really to the places i lived in right so it's either the uk vietnam mexico or bangkok itself but i would say the quality here is actually very good in terms of roads. They're very well maintained in the city itself because the city is actually quite large. But yeah, like they, they invest a lot on on infrastructure, and yeah, it's the probably the best quality I think out of those places I I've uh, mentioned, apart from UK, obviously, because there's lots of legislation around it. But even things like apartment buildings, I think Bangkok. Yeah. Definitely better than Mexico and definitely better than Vietnam. And it's cheaper, which is awesome. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> cool. So, I mean, okay, you mentioned like, you know, it's it's a religious country and everything. Sorry, I'm the one that's doing the interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious to find out. Um, over here as well, it's very religious and not religious in a sense that okay it's extreme like don't go out clubbing don't go out drinking because it's it is prominently a christian uh, um, country um i do however find that you know you can do all these things like go out have fun drink that's fine but when it comes to now uh socializing with people and looking at things from like a broader perspective that's where you find the challenge to kind of you know get your views across because um, let's say I'm, I'm at the stage now where I respect everyone's religion, I respect everyone's belief, and 
you know, let's let's move forward that way, okay? Whatever works for you is fine. Let's let's move forward. Um, what I've found here is that I've been unable to kind of make, you know, a, a number of friends because a lot of things are still taboo in the minds of some people. Like you cannot question, you know, you cannot question certain things, for example. And okay, there's no need to question, but when the certain aspects in life that need you to think outside the box. When someone just runs to religion and uses that as a, as a getaway or as a, you know as an escape to say okay this is going to save me without actually tackling the real problem that's where the development you know now becomes a problem so that's where I've kind of clashed with not clash but I've just you know been more of an aloof individual just concentrating on building my own skills and advancing at work is Thailand the same way like. Is there anything that you would advise me not to do there that might offend the people, for example? So, I think there are a lot of cult cultural nuances that I'm still getting used to. For example, right, Thai culture is very uh, non-conflicting. You don't want to conflict with anybody. You know, you want like this like peaceful sort of harmony between people. And I really love that concept, but it's not very good. If it's in a working environment, because you want to be effective and productive and have these good conversations, like what the fuck happened and how do we prevent yeah. it from happening again? <laughs> exactly. exactly. But you yeah. can't ask those questions in a way, in public, and you know, call people out, and that's just not a very effective way of doing it because and then you have to like, you know, suggest changes or like, I don't know, just like play the game uh, without even knowing how to play the game because you're not Thai, right? So for me. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Um, but I think, of course, there are. I think there's also a very clear divide sometimes uh, at work, your expat group and your local group, right? And, and there's a very clear divide. But what is great about Thailand and Thai culture is that they're very accepting of others. Other ideas and stuff, they're fine with it. Uh, because that's why people come to travel here and that's why that you know they're one of the nicest cultures to interact with and, and they're all over the world because you know they don't really give a fuck like buddhism or not it's cool man yeah. Yeah. however there are some these culture things that maybe we don't fit in because where we were brought up and and, and where we're taught like to question it and, and not you know and to break out of that being weird is okay. Maybe it's a more of a conform culture, conforming culture, where it's like, oh no, like, you know, if you're going to say, but there are these little pockets of people that we might be more aligned to. For example, they have their own, you know, hip hop culture, their dancing culture. They're also very creative in a sense. Lots of great art and photography out here and, and music. So. I don't think you'll struggle with that. For me, uh, I think I find it hard to make friends anyway. You saw the house that we grew up in, right? It's like people we already knew, you know, and, and you know, no new friends kind of policy, which is kind of stupid. <laughs> like, we'll just keep in our circle. Like, if you're cool, you're cool. But, you know, we don't let too many people in, whatever, right? It's very sort of gang culture shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I kind of grew out of that as soon as I moved to Asia because I was like, oh, I'm here on my own. So I've got to try and, and at least have an effort to make these friends. But I found myself sticking to more the people that are similar to me, right? Uh, so a lot of expats or like Asian expats, like one of my good mates is a uh, Vietnamese American or I've made some, you know, Thai Thai mixed race friends here. Not saying that I wouldn't make friends with locals, but uh, sometimes it's just a little bit difficult. It just, it just depends what you prefer. But I don't think making friends is that difficult here because every like people are just welcoming in general. So it's very easy to make acquaintances. So there's no weird thing like okay, don't uh, salute, don't don't say hi with your right hand because your right hand's used for like eating. So like this and that and blah blah blah. No taboos like that then. Yeah. Right. Oh, so there's one thing. Apparently, you shouldn't throw stuff at people. I'll give you an example, right? So uh, you have this adapter for the Mac and you need yeah. this adapter to connect to the projector. So I was like, oh yeah, can you pass me that adapter? Oh, just throw it. And they're like, no, 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 you can't do that. And I was like, why not? It's so much quicker. And they're like, no, you have to pass it, otherwise it's rude. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like, I, I didn't know that, right? 
Uh, you're not supposed to show the bottom of your feet to another person because, like, that's the bottom of your foot. You know, like, it's disrespectful in another way. But I'm, I'm, I'm slowly learning these cultural nuances. Yeah, those are the ones I found from experience. Yeah. Okay, nothing we can't live with except for just pass me the damn thing, throw it. But yeah, I guess it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not something difficult to adapt to. Yeah. Also hierarchical. It's a very top-down sort of viewpoint, especially at work and possibly yeah. in the family as well, which is quite Asian culture, right? Uh, at this part of the world, it's, it's very much like that. So sometimes you run into like, do you speak first? Do you ask questions? Uh, like, or you just say yes because that person like asked you, and you don't sort of push back. So this is something I'm trying to actively train out of uh, my team. I'm like, look, if you have a question, and you don't ask it. That's like that's a big no no, right? Other you ask it now, then you spend like a day to think about it, and then ask it. So you do you already wasted a day, and there's no point in doing that. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, the company I work for is pretty, um, <clears throat> it's highly dominated, like most of our senior managers are Indian. Well, Indian, Sri Lankan, and then there's myself, I'm, you know, well, my nationality is Italian, though ethnically I'm half Italian, half Congolese, but, you know, I have like, you know, a whole wide culture, you know, experience, because, you know, I, I spent like 13 or is it 12 years in the UK so then you know um, I'm very very open minded so you know you find the Indians kind of secluded in their own uh, ambiance and being a senior manager you, you don't need to do that you need to communicate effectively to everyone but they only communicate effectively with themselves because they use their own language as well which is a bit of a you know a bit of a challenge but we just hired I think our new CFO is, is from Sri Lanka <clears throat> and yeah he's He's, he's a loner, so he speaks in English and he makes sure that English is kind of uh, the official language across the whole the whole board. Uh, our directors are from Greece, but, you know, English is, is the main language that they speak because Zambia is officially, an, an, I mean, an English official speaking country. So, li like you've mentioned, we, we do have certain divides in the organization where certain people feel like, okay... We don't need to discuss this because we're only going to discuss it among ourselves. So not everyone in the board meeting needs to have an idea of what's going on. And then when it comes up to like, you know, having to come up with a solution and they get stuck, that's when they turn to you and say, oh, by the way, there's this uh, this problem. And you ask, OK, how did this escalate to this level? Why didn't you, you know, um, bring this before kind of thing? Like, I, I kind of understand what you're trying to say. But yeah, yeah. Do you have the same thing? Like the people yeah. that communicate? Definitely. I hate that. I, I, I hate that that has to happen. I know I know we're kind of like assholes, right? Because we're like, oh, we got lucky yeah. because of English. Yeah, yeah. So we, we kind of expect that. But really, like, what's the common company language is, is, is my thing, right? So it's, yeah. all, it's not about communication silos. The more yeah. transparent it is in terms of, like, the information we provide everybody in the company, not just the senior management... Uh, the better, because it means that everybody knows what they're doing, everybody can access the information. So that definitely happens, and that, I don't think that's how you run an effective organization. Of course, you need to keep things close to your heart if it's very sensitive sort that's of... Yeah. Yeah. You, you, yeah, at the end of the day, yeah, the more people that's involved, or at least know about it, the the better I feel. Yeah, it, it's annoying, like, it's some... some Meetings that we have, it's like 50% is Thai, and I'm just sitting there like, uh, do you guys just want to switch to English? Because what the fuck are you guys talking about? Like, I, I get it, right? It's, it, it's harder for them, but if it's truly an international environment, let's stick to a, a common language, or at least have good documentation to back it up, right? Uh, when I worked in Mexico, it was actually very awesome. Spanish is one of the most spoken languages in the world, but they would really make an effort. If they see you sitting down, even at lunch, and they're speaking Spanish, they'll switch to English immediately, just so you feel included, right? And I think that's a really nice thing uh, about Mexico. That's why I really enjoyed it. In Thailand and, um, and in Vietnam, they don't give a fuck. 
it's a habit you train at work, right? You have to constantly remind people, be like, oh, sorry, what was that? Do you mind switching to English? So I wanted to ask you a question, dude. Uh, I know you wanted to talk about it as well. Uh, the subject that you uh, mentioned to me earlier, right? The growth and stagnation of digital products in a developing economy. How do we discuss this topic? Let's say, for example, you, you work in UX, right? Yep. And UX is a very fundamental and very, very important aspect in a in, in any end product, like, you know, in, in terms of usability, like this design, you know, any any product that needs to kind of be accessed, whether it's it's a system or whether it's dissemination of information and, and all that. Um, I feel like here in Zambia, okay, th- there's there's not much appreciation for, for that. The um, reason I'm saying this is because, okay, th- there's not quite a diverse... Uh, landscape, if you want to call it that, uh, there's not a diverse landscape for for UX or let's say for information design to be implemented uh, with yielding um, rewards. Uh, you could say, okay, you know, a designer can come up and say, right, I'm I'm good at this, I'm good at that, and then try and create a system. But there needs to be an application to it. The application needs to be useful. So you find that most of these, uh, let's say, digital Let's say designers, for example, graphic designers, uh, photographers, video content uh, developers, as well as, let's say, user experience. But I don't think UX is quite common here yet because people just want to, you know, design something real quick and then get it out there without actually thinking of the implications of, of the, you know, the, the user, the end user. So you find, like like you mentioned earlier, um, systems where, like, you can just use your phone to send money to someone. Um, you already got your text uh, your text platform, which is like it's the text has been used for I don't know how many years now since the mobile phones got created. So that's a very easy uh, platform for people to access. Creating an app, on the other hand, creating a website, on the other hand, people do not put into consideration the user experience principles or you know any principles that need to be applied in user experience. People just think, okay, as long as it gets the job done, then that's it. So like uh, we've got. Um, a website here where you need to buy, let's say, bundles for your uh, for your internet, okay? And I was looking at the design on there, and I'm just like, you know, this is an official website where you need to pay, you know, and they take money from your account. But if you look at it, you know, you ask questions. You say, you know, was there really much much thought process, you know, put put behind the whole design? And I think that's that's a bit of a challenge that we're facing here in Zambia. No one's really putting into consideration u- usability and, and user end, end access. As long as you just access the information and you're able to, you know, use the functions, then that's it. It doesn't matter whether you align a text to the left or to the right. I mean, there are some basic design rules that they follow, but I think it's still, you know, a bit backwards in, yeah. in that aspect. I think even in the US sometimes, right? Like, you know, US is seen as this like global innovator in products and technology. I think it happens every motherfucking way, right? But everybody should like know that it's a really important part. And I also think because unless you're quite technical and you're a developer, they don't look yeah. at your they don't look at your code and they say, oh, No, you shouldn't do it like that, man. Like here's you know, like, I don't like it. Like why did you do the syntax, this wrong, blah blah blah. Right? You don't really look at that. You don't really question software development in, in quite the same way as you do with design. Because design, everybody can give feedback on design because everybody has a preference, right? They only see it for the visual aesthetic versus like all the things in the background, right? Like user needs, uh, business value, you know, information, accessibility, you know, ergonomics, or all, all these things that really has to be considered when you produce and when you make a product because it's getting it's going to be more and more important and it's going to be ubiquitous as everything becomes digitalized right like government systems or any sort of interface that you like maybe like menus now are getting you know placed on iPads and stuff like that so how do you order food so it's going to be ubiquitous it's just how quickly the adoption rate is for the companies building those products because majority of startups, they 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 really focus on maybe the business model and then the development. So as long as it's functional, we don't give a fuck, right? Uh, and yeah. then about sales and marketing and customer service. And des- designers really like it happens in every organization. Design 
is really just an afterthought uh, of product development, right, or, or, or of development. So you're like, what the fuck? Because actually, you can apply design thinking to everything, to every sort of problems in your life, you can apply it to, right? So really, for me, the power of it is like, you do it at the beginning of how this product even exists in the real world or the concept, and then you take it through there. So what we're trying to do, or what we've done in my previous organization as well, is to like establish a strong design culture where everybody can feel like they are a designer, just our outputs are different, right? Us is like the interface, for example, or the flows or the user journey. For them, it might be something else because design needs to be this collaborative process of, of bringing and connecting all these dots together. In the emerging market, everything is running at such a pace that what comes first, right? So it's like development probably, design like the first UX role I think was in the 80s by this guy called Don Norman and he had the first role and it was UX architect at uh, Apple his his background is like an engineer but also he did psychology and then there was (laughs) a crazy power plant meltdown that then he was like there to sort of figure out like what are the symptoms like how how like you know what actually happened and how do we prevent it and he looked at all the buttons and stuff then he started thinking about like engineering things and also the psychology of human behavior like oh because maybe it wasn't clear enough so therefore there was all these errors that linked together that caused this massive catastrophe right and then he wrote a book when he went to europe and it's called the design of everyday things because basically he couldn't figure out like how taps work light switches doorknobs and all this stuff he was like what this is like so messed up it's not like america at all from there it kind of branched out of of this sort of thinking pattern of like what is you know user experience or what is human centered design right actually it's it's so much easier to explain this concept about physical things right for for example like your keyboard right Uh, table your chair you know you don't need to ask the question how you sit down you just sit down right exactly you're right so, but with interfaces, it's so different. Like, I, d- I don't know why we've, we haven't we have figured this out. And I think from your perspective and my perspective, it's our job to sort of be like, no, 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 no. Let's step back and see the value of it. And that's what I've been trying to do since I got into this field because I, I, I find it so important. And I find design, like, everything to do in my life could be thought in that kind of way. Uh, and that's why I do it. Um, but, yeah, back to your question. Yeah, it, it's like... Yeah, it's a fuckery, basically. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you because uh, well, even when I started out, design actually helped me to get where I am right now because you get employed to, to implement this system and then you need to understand the, the, the processes. So you have to break those processes down. In uh, You have to visualize them. You're not just going to say, oh, yeah, the customer walks in, he looks at the product and pays. Okay, so you actually need to visualize this. How are you going to visualize them? You're not going to take pictures of a customer's footsteps all the way from the entrance of the store to when he goes to the shelf. No, you're going to break it down in little you know, like little um, information trees. So you say, okay, or in stages, for example. So you design a little mind map or, you know, even brainstorm ideas to say, okay, stay, step one, customer walks in store. Step two, he does this. And then with that design principle, you can actually create even a, a Gantt chart to see how long a customer spends in a store, for example. The the, the efficiency, I think the the importance of design that a lot of people are not realizing is that if you make design better, like if you make user interfaces quicker to access, like it actually speeds up the end result, like what it is you're trying to achieve. If you don't put these into consideration, let's say you put two systems together, one that's very well designed and the other one that's just like all over the place. The functionality might be the same, but the person that's using the better designed interface finishes quicker than the one that's still trying to figure out, okay, where do I go from here? Do you understand? Like it's it's also a journey. Like you said, the user journey, it does not need to be hectic. You want it to be smooth <laughs> and you want it to be, you know, you want you want it to go, to go. Um, you don't want to spend a lot of uh, the client's time or you don't want the client to spend a lot of time looking at one thing or trying to figure out one thing and then having the same result. So yeah. I think, 
companies still still need to appreciate design in, in that aspect and look at it that way. Definitely. So, so what? Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this technique called service blueprint. Yeah. So it, it's what you're talking about, right? Each sort of interaction that your customer has with your service. So a lot of services are like online and offline. For example, banking, right? How do yes. you open an account? Now, first, you go to the website. You look at uh, the information, and then you might pop into a branch, and then you might need to bring some like ID along with you, and then you open your account, and then you can do like the banking, right? And then you pay for stuff. So all of those steps are needs to be purposefully designed for it to be effective, right? It needs to be linked together. There's multiple people that are involved in each process. So, like, how do you think of it as a system, as a bigger thing than just the application? Is what people yes. are kind of like missing out on the larger picture, like the holistic service. Like traditionally, Apple are very good at this. You walk into an Apple store, design it a certain way to make you play with the products, and then when you try to buy something, you don't need to pay with your money. They've got your Apple ID. Boom. Done right, and then the installation process. Like it's very easy, right? Apple, of course, is a success story, but they focus it so much on making that really easy and appealing that there's no wonder why their products are one of the best products in the world, right? But on that tangent, one way that companies have been doing it in the past few years is actually linking the value of design to businesses, right? And、uh, organizational impact,、uh, things like customer satisfaction, actually how much money you would end up saving if you thought about it,、uh, impact on revenue, total re-、uh, return to shareholders. So McKinsey has this really good report that I'll send you after this. The business value of design. It's great because it speaks into、uh, to what CEOs care about or what executives care about. How much return on investment am I getting? How much money am I saving? You know the fucking hard numbers. That they're like,、mm. oh, like I don't like this principal shit. I want to see like how much would it actually save me. So、uh, if you ever speak about this, you can leverage their study, and you can be like, look, man, like it's it's a study done by McKinsey of lots of different corporations, like a thousand different corporations in lots of different fields. Envision does a lot of the, these sort of educational industry analysis that helps designers speak to that because they know. Now, one of the common themes is how do I sell the value of design to my stakeholders? How do I get them to invest time and money into this? One way is to say, "Hey, you'll save money," and here's the here's the proof. You want to give it a、yeah. go, right? Yeah. And, and that's very logical because what designers traditionally don't do is like you know we're creatives. We're like you don't need to understand what we're doing. We just want to be like artists, right? We want to paint this canvas, but really <laughs> that's not the way to appeal, right? It's not. Yeah, to tell people like, oh, you don't understand my art, so fuck off. It's really like to speak the languages of your users, right? Whether they're developers, business people, grandmas at Tesco, whatever it is. So、uh, those are now very, very valuable to to any career as a designer. If you can speak to these different things, like you're doing with data, right? You're doing with stakeholders. That is like one of the, I think, super undervalued skill of designers that are going into market today. I think design education has become more sophisticated and, and you know very sort of industry based, where you do internships. But traditionally, if you learn this on your own, you might not really think about stuff like that, right? You just want to do the Photoshop or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And、uh, getting back to you know、um, the question that you asked or the way I phrased the, the topic. Uh, in a develop in a in a developing economy, perhaps now that you've mentioned that even in the U.S. things like this happen, do you think perhaps like because I I thought it all came down to not having enough access to the education or to you know、uh, training designers to to think this way or you know not not enough platforms to educate or to build designers,、um, but I mean I'm sure Thailand does offer. Designer courses,、uh, the UK does as well, and America does. Why do you think that even with this education, what was still? I mean, look, I'm not saying all their websites and all their systems are shit. You know, you have really good ones, but then you have really shit ones. But why do you think we still have shit ones? Shouldn't be, a, shouldn't it be like a standard to have a certain, you know, pattern of information flow, for example? Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's a number of things you've touched on. I think education is definitely one of them. 
not surprising because it's a relatively new field that's only been around for 30 years, maybe, you know, maybe less, especially with the term UX designer. So yeah, I think education uh, or there's lack of design talent in CDO management on the on the yeah. CEO. Also, if you don't have someone like a, a CDO, a chief of design, then things are going to get left out, right? You need a bunch of strong founders with really strong backgrounds in that for it to really work organizational wide because then initiatives will get born from that. But it is also how education is is treating UX. So when I started, I you know never heard about it, but there are some really, really good schools in the UK and really good schools in America. Everything else is online, a, a bit a bit weird, like General Assembly are doing great work in terms of running these workshops. Uh, and so is uh, Norman Nielsen Group, but they're super expensive. It's like 10 grand for a weekend. <laughs> and you get certificates that said you've done it, but that doesn't mean that you can do it, right? Um, in a weekend, how much can you learn in a weekend, man? Like, it, there's a lot of that. Majority of the, the literature out there on this is also in English. So a large certain population of the world don't even get that. Yeah, I think that it, it's a multitude of things, but then that poses an opportunity for people like me and you. Yes. Which, yes. which is great. And that's kind of what we need to capitalize on in terms of being leaders, being outspoken, focusing on the passion and, and what it means to us. Yeah, some of the symptoms is also like this, dude. Education in this part of the world is also very sort of memory based. You're never really taught critical thinking. You're like, okay, read this book, you know, learn the equations of how to solve this problem and just do it. UX is not like that. It's not really a science, although we take scientific methodologies, right? <laughs> With like your yeah, research yeah, yeah. and your hypothesis, but it isn't really hard science. There's so much nuance in human behavior that, you know, you need to be a critical thinker and a collaborator to pull that all together, tie with your experience and processes and toolbox. I think that's why it's also harder for, you know, emerging markets that might not have that education background of real critical thinking. That's why it's been adopted a lot more slowly than some of these hard sciences like chemistry or biology or, or, or maths or physics or whatever. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, when, when I was... Um and trying to enter into the, the Zambian market okay, with the digital digital marketing business concept, I actually found myself having to read a lot of business books, for example, business development groups. Fair enough, I had to learn, uh, I had to refresh my memory on like, you know, design principles here and there, but I found myself reading a lot of business uh, material in order to kind of, you know, merge the two concepts together. So I, I think as well, maybe maybe in the, in the near future, uh, what the education systems need to think about, like anyone trying to create a, a designing course, or maybe yeah, not not I mean designing courses are already there, but like anyone that's trying to uh, educate designers and certify them needs to put into consideration that it's not just about you know putting things together; it's also about understanding the the client and the looking at the multiple. Uh, diverse, di diverse clients that you might you might work with. There's not only businesses. There's also like hospitals. There's also like let's say uh, production factories. Because before I actually landed this job, I was doing a lot of work for my uh, for my dad. Actually, he was he's a uh, he was a senior pediatrician, or shall I say, head of pediatrics at uh, the local hospitals in Kitwe, which is one of the towns here in Zambia. And I had to help him. Uh, with creating, you know, certain PowerPoints to, to make it easier for his students, the nurses and the junior doctors to kind of grasp the information uh, better. So if you were to looking at malnutrition, for example, in children, um, what are the key elements that a child needs to have? Uh, yeah, I think as designers, we need to be kind of open to learning other sectors and other aspects. We Like, we can specialize in designing, yes, but we need to be very open in not learning fully or specializing in other domains, but being able to capture that information quickly in order for us to create a design that is uh, tailored towards the client uh, as well. That's such a good point, man. Like, if I was to throw out a controversial concept out there, it would be that 
you teach this very, very young and in schools, right? Like everybody should have a mind of a designer and like an engineer as well. You know, design and engineering in educational systems right at the start. How to think, how to solve problems, how to be resourceful. And then from the engineering side, the logical aspect of putting things together and obviously learning computing because that's really what the future is. It's fundamental to how education should be designed because education is, is a design problem too. Like every problem could be a design problem, right? It's crazy, man. I don't know. This design thing has just screwed my life up. How, how, how has it screwed your life up? It's, uh, you know, life, is, life is a design. Life is a design. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's even like books now about, there's this book called Design Your Life. And it's a approach like using design thinking as a way to basically, you know, live a happy life. Think about different things that you could do and how you prototype it, how you test it and see if you want to do. So, for example, if you want to change careers to become an architect, maybe you need to get into architect circles, speak to an architect, really do little steps to test whether your solution or one way to live your life would actually work or suit you love this shit. Nah, that, that, that is sick that is fucking sick actually because that that's the mind state or mindset that i've actually had even when um trying to like come up with business concepts because i don't know well i'm sure you remember uh, i did like an esports tournament that was pretty successful uh, a couple years ago yeah um so even even my way of thinking before doing that like i've had no esports business or methodology experience ever but i had to sort of for, for a period of two weeks i had no actually it was three months <laughs> and then the last two weeks was was the actual execution but i had to think in a like you've said in in a designer's mind frame i had to now start like okay step one i need to do research on this step two i need to contact this person step three i need to do that until i eventually came out with an end result which was pretty successful even the whole planning of of like the videos and look you might not get a hundred percent execution all the time but to think like that always gives you uh, a clear view of what you might end up with and you know what what it is you're trying to achieve it can help you to set certain goals and then at the end of that uh, that race or that run you rate yourself to say okay and then you assess to say well okay what can i do better maybe i can add some more steps to my design principle or i can eliminate some steps that maybe took uh, a lot of time or okay i've now accomplished step one and step two this is a repetitive step uh, these are repetitive steps i don't need to repeat them in my next process uh kind of feel so like yeah you you are right life life at the end of the day is a design as well man and you can use that to your benefit definitely man like, but i'm interested how did you start to think like this or when do you think you started to think like this i'd say after uni uh, i'd say when i last spoke to you um no we actually spoke in 2015 2015 or 2016 i'm not quite sure when i asked you if you knew uh, if you could design an application or if you knew anyone that could build apps because i was trying to build uh, like a uh, educational app for like kindergarten kids do you remember that yep yeah okay so i think it was it was then because i did a lot of after university i kind of you know i worked for a couple of years came into Zambia, tried to push this business thing and, you know, due to finances, we couldn't go far and, you know, we needed to make a lot of connections. So we said, okay, let's put everything to one side and let's start getting connected. So the way to get connected is obviously to work, show your worth, get into a position where you're actually influential. So th those those were the steps that I took. Now, in when I got into those steps, I mean, working with, with different people, like looking at people's flaws, for example, and, you know, thinking, okay, this could be done better, like company flaws, like to see where they're actually not doing good, because due to experience, like you've actually seen a principle work elsewhere, and you ask yourself, why isn't this principle being applied here? So then reading on those principles, doing a lot of research, and then finally, I mean, I just had this moment, all my experience, all my knowledge just put itself together and said, okay, uh, this is the mind that you've you've uh, you've built till this date, and this is where you need to go. And on your uh, on your path, you have to learn this, you have to learn that in order for you to get to a certain stage. So even finding myself in this whole database um, 
sorry, uh, data analysis position, it it all started from design. Do you understand? In all essence, I had to do a lot of reading, and it was after university, after I had like that blow when I felt disappointed and down that the company didn't work well, and you know I had a lot of family. Um, family issues as well because I was living down with my parents as well so there was a lot of debate whether I did the right thing to study what I did at my university whether I was in the right uh, country to like develop my skills and this and that and there was a lot of like I was cornered in into like a self-defense self-defense mechanism kind of situation but I, I wasn't trying to prove myself with dialogue I was trying to prove myself with practicality and, and 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 you know trying to apply what I learned and I think that's where now the you know that that thought process started kind of coming out. Um, so yeah, I think that answers your question. I hope. <laughs> yeah, man, and, and that's like so good to hear that transformation. Like uh, obviously, you know, the bad times are not as good, but it teaches us such a valuable lesson. And I'm I'm glad you came out the other side, like fighting and. <laughs> And, and stood up and that's fucking cool right like yeah that's what a great story that's fucking amazing dude but like yeah man yeah man I'm, I'm pretty happy that design has gotten us this far <laughs> yeah i mean for me it was weird right so like bumbled around for a bit after uni because basically i i tried university again uh so i actually graduated in business and then i was like oh what am i gonna do so i saved up a bunch of money and always knew that I wanted to go to Vietnam for a bit, so got my six months ticket. Was just like, oh, visiting my parents because back then they had uh, retired. So it was just like chilling. Decided to stay. Got my first job at a tech company. Then I was like fascinated with just working in the tech company. I thought these people are super cool. It's super cash. Like this is the environment I want to work in. Uh, touched a little bit on digital marketing and stuff. And then I was like, shit, man, this is cool. And I got really into design. Well, I just built my friend's website and I was like, whoa, I just spent 13 hours at a computer and I really fucking loved it. Could I do this for a living? Went freelance for a bit. And then as soon as I, you know, got my first design gig, like one or two years later, maybe. Yeah, it was it was a wrap for me. That was it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure you might be in the same mind mindset as well, and I, I am too. Like, we learned the basics to move, you know, to like go forward. Look, we're never too old to learn, or I mean, we're never too yeah, we're never too young or too old to learn. You know, learning and gaining knowledge always is is very important and essential as we go along. But you know, with with where we are, I think it's always good to apply what we have in the moment. And if you apply that in the moment and it takes you to another level, then you kind of tell yourself or you kind of, you know, have to give yourself a, a clap and say, look, I think I've been doing the right thing because from one thing it leads to another and you keep growing like that. Then like, yeah, like you said, it's, you found something that, you know, you could, you decided, can I do this for a living? And like, you know, it, 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 it kind of fascinated you and you wanted to build on that and it's, you know, you capitalized on it and now you're here, for example. You're the head of uh, design and that's like, that's big, bro. As designers, we all have like imposter syndrome, right? Do I belong here? Am I good enough? You look at your peers, yes. and more experienced than you, you're like, ah, oh, fuck. I am stoked that I'm here. It's still one of those roles that I'm trying to lean into and, and to figure out what it means to be like a design leader and how to navigate because now i don't do much design you know i try to uh, connect people teach or like build processes i guess and so it's, it's very different in terms of just designing so i'm still figuring out if i like it or not yeah yet again it's one of those learnings right like if you don't like it it's cool you can just go back to do whatever you think you're good at i also haven't been designing for very long that's also an imposter syndrome that i have because i'm like a uh, number of years number of years because yeah it's uh it's it's been an interesting and fun journey to to be here have you traveled much around africa on your on your journey or have you really stuck in the one place uh look i've, I've had uh, contact with uh, people from different uh, african companies like nigeria and rwanda uh, kenya uh, and South Africa, but I have just stuck in Zambia. I mean, the other places that I've mentioned are, are more advanced uh, 
in, in this industry uh, as compared to Zambia, to be quite honest with you. And I'm sure even the pay there is good and, you know, you work with, with uh, different mindsets, like different cultured uh, individuals. And like, yeah, it, it, it would have been nice to explore those areas. But I was, I was here in Zambia because um, I lived with my parents. Yep. Uh, no, not that I lived with my parents. My parents were nearby. I lived by myself. But then I always thought like, okay, my parents are getting older as well. So there was that social aspect as well. Like my parents are getting older. I don't want to be too far from them. I need to be nearby just in case anything happens, blah, blah. I'm like here, right? Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, I kind of, that's, that's kind of what kept me in Zambia for a while. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed, but like I lost my mom like last year, early last year. Oh, shit. Um, no, it didn't matter. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, very, very weird uh, place to be in mentally and uh, socially. I felt like my brain had to be rewired again. So, like, I had to start everything from scratch because I had a lot of drive and a lot of, you know, and that's why you didn't hear anything about the Yoji Esports. Um, it was supposed to be a big thing last year, but once that happened, I kind of put every project on hold because I don't think I was psychologically prepared to, you know, to carry on. So, like, yeah, yeah. Ever since I met yeah. you at uni, you, you yeah. always have drive. You're always doing different things, and, like, you're, you're super interesting into what you like and, and, and the rate that you learn. But you, you, you've you always done projects, and that's just a part of you, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. I was just trying to get uh, to the stage that, yes, uh, last year was a bit stagnant because of the whole moaning process. But, like, yeah, this year, moving on, I'm, I'm looking forward to newer challenges, man. Like, I'm always, uh, you, yeah, like, like you've said, <laughs> you, you know me well, so I'm, I'm always, like, project-driven. Since, uh, since that happened, obviously, I think, I'm not saying it's a good thing now, I can travel the world more and I can move out of Zambia. But I'm just saying, like, yeah, okay, maybe, you know, everything happens for a reason and, like, I, I think, like, now I can maybe, like, travel travel out more because my main concern was to, like, make sure that my parents were okay, you know, support them financially, this and that. So, like, you know, now that mom's kind of gone, I think, like, she would want me to to do what I've always wanted to do. And that's, like, to move to move forward and, and learn and work on, you know, different kinds of projects. And if those projects are out of Zambia and around the world, then by all means, man. Right, yeah. We have to move forward, right, as people. And um, I think your mom would want it as well. You not only doing great things, but enjoying life and, and having these experiences that really inspire us as designers. You know, all that stuff that, that life offers, right? I'm looking forward to Asia. <laughs> Bro, it's, uh, it's a different world. Some people are like, yes, I can't live here. Some people can't, but I think you would definitely love it. What has your time been like in, in Zambia in terms of like the dating scene? Or can we not talk about that? <laughs> 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 Very funny guy. I was going to ask you that question first, man. Uh, <laughs> I was just waiting, like, okay, when's the right opportunity to say, hey, what about the cash? cash? <laughs> Bear cash, bro. Okay, so um, <laughs> I, I won't lie, okay? I'll be very blunt with you. On my journey, when, my, when I decided, okay, I need to start getting serious and getting my life together after, you know, uh, uni and, and Zambia's business entrepreneurship uh, failure, uh, I told myself, okay, I need to start getting serious with life and like just concentrate. And I'm that sort of person that I can't be too complacent or too comfortable and then still try to work hard. Like I need to be disciplined. Uh, it's just in my nature. Like I need to be disciplined when I'm working towards something. So when I joined the company, I was at a very, very low position. I was just like a simple uh, operator that had to capture data. But then I capitalized on the opportunity. So I had to learn a lot when I joined the group. And that did not give me any time to have any sort of relationship that would require my time as well. I had to be 24-7 on the job for me to like even like go up the levels that I've reached right now. Like right now, I, I joined senior management uh, two years after I worked for the, for the company, which is a very short time to get yourself to that level. Amazing. Yeah, that, 
Yeah, <laughs> that's because I needed discipline. So I spent a lot of my time when I wasn't at work. I had to do a lot of reading. I had to do a lot of like practicals, you know, uh, because data data analysis was like a new field to me completely. So I had to like learn the coding, how to use different softwares. And so I would come home from work at 5 p.m., prepare my dinner because I live by myself in like a two bedroom apartment, uh, cook my dinner and everything. And then right after that, get on YouTube, get onto like uh, different like Power BI, for example. I had to learn that, you know, different tutorials, different books uh, up to like about 11 p.m. So 11 p.m. I go to bed, wake up at 3 a.m. and start doing a lot of work. Because remember, when you're implementing an ERP system, it's not like you just create a software and then that's it. No, there's a lot of um, functionality issues. So you have to test all that. So I I didn't have any time for that up until about uh, last, no, last year now. I'd say up until about 2018, January, because I started working for these guys in like 2016. So 2018 January is when I had a bit of time. I thought to myself, okay, let me try and date. Um, I was seeing this girl, but then the situation was very complicated, and I don't think I can reveal it online. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no, don't reveal that. Yeah, don't reveal that. <laughs> yeah. but let's just say it, it, it was something that we always had to keep on the low, and I was just like, yeah, it, it was long, man. It was something that no one had to know, and this and that. Um, there's been some nice girls at work as well, but you know, being being at the level of management that I'm at, I can't date an employee or someone who's at a lower position than myself because that's frowned upon. Only not only by by the directors, but even myself, I'd feel like, yeah, it's a bit, yeah, you know, it's a bit me too. Um, it's a bit me too movement. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I've, I've had partners. I've had a couple of partners here and there. Um, and then I started, like, seeing this Thai girl, but then even that's on and off. So I'm really just focusing on, like, my professionalism, but then when I need to have, like, some time, you know, with with the member of the opposite sex, I haul at my links and then be like, yo, you want to chill, you know, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know the boy. No, nah, I'm joking. No, 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 it's not sexual, trust me. It's not Shut sexual. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm being honest here. You're making me sound like a womanizer. It's not sexual at all. Like I've got like a list of friends. Like last weekend, I just had like lunch with one of them just because I needed, you know, some company, and that's about it. So you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah, pl- platonic friends are, are are good, right? We all need some sort of human connection, and not always from the same sex. But yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, dating in Asia is interesting, right? Yeah. So in Vietnam, it's very interesting because um, a lot of the population are are definitely younger. So like you're yeah. 18 to 30s. So that, that makes up majority of the population. So everybody's looking out to have a good time, having new experiences. You know, everybody is joining the workforce. There's more people that age. So yeah, there's a lot of people and... What I found is uh, they're very interested in people that are from abroad, right? I'm Asian. I look Asian, but I don't act or, or, or you know, or speak like uh, maybe their, their friends they went to school with. So there's a lot of interest around there, which is cool because it's like automatically they're more interested in you. And you're like, yeah, Yo, what up? Holla, holla. <laughs> holla. <laughs> so it's cool. And, uh, you know. Yeah, it, it is very fun. A lot of people come to Asia specifically for that reason. I was definitely not here for that reason, but I found out to be that was one of the things I really enjoyed where you can meet a lot of people and they're not really afraid to sort of like speak to you. It's not kind of like in... All right, so let me paint you a picture of a standard night out in England, okay? It's basically uh, you go to Weatherspoons with like your mates like let's say a bunch of single guys you get really fucking wasted and then you go to the club you might try and hit on some girls but they'll look at you like what the fuck right or you might be lucky but it's not really that interactive uh, and and that sort of uh, open right Uh, because they always think oh you're just trying to sleep with them blah 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 here in asia people don't really have that barrier at the front which makes it 
more Sweet. enjoyable because you can easily just become friends or start a relationship. And that's cool. Yes. Like, whatever. Oh, that's right? cool. That's very good. Yeah. Because you need to build on something. Like, that's a problem. Like, I found that in the UK, like, you might genuinely see someone that's very nice and say, oh, you know what? I might want to talk to this person the next day, even when I'm not drunk. Like, try and build a, a friendship and then eventually take it somewhere. But they get so defensive and they feel like, okay, all you're looking after is sex. And that's the same thing, the same culture that's here um, as well. You try to talk to a girl, they'll look at you and say, okay, you're probably up to no good. Maybe because of the way you're dressed or maybe because of, you know, how you're looking. You're looking too fresh so you look like a playboy or something like that. And there's, you know, there's no genuine openness to say, okay, let me see what this person is about. You know, let's let's communicate. Let's see how far that goes. Um, so yeah, no, I'm 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 happy with that, man. If I if I land to that, hey, I'm more than happy, bro. Yeah, man, because like I think yeah, that well, that's really annoying to hear that Zambia is also like that, where like some reason that you know females don't feel like that they can like open up a bit more in Vietnam. It, it was very much like I I felt very comfortable talking. To, to like anybody like you know as an expat that's kind of yeah. the first step of making friends right like you just say yeah. oh hey how you doing otherwise it's just awkward because you don't have any friends uh, in thailand it is maybe uh like it's uh it's less approachable than vietnam i found vietnam to be very comfortable but in thailand it's still you know quite open and people are quite friendly the one bad thing about expats coming to another country is they make a bad name for uh for people who yes. live expats who live there right they're just travelers because they're just like they just come to fuck right so <laughs> and then it drives a lot of women to be like yo you know what i'm not your holiday girlfriend man so like there's, there's that barrier but you know when they know you're like living here and stuff that makes them more comfortable to you know have conversations because you know because expats are really like irresponsible right they're just like oh i'm here for three days who can i bang and that's it yeah, so there's a delicate situation there, but I think it's definitely more open than uh, your your story and also the UK because UK is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy you mentioned that because like, nah, you you you've just see you re you removed a lot of information from me. So I want to know your dating life. Tell me about your experience, bro. I know you've what? given me an overall picture. <laughs> I thought I was going to give an analysis. I thought, oh, shit. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, so, so I stayed in Vietnam. When I first got there, I stayed in Vietnam for like four months. And during those four months, uh, I was traveling around. So, like, I did Thailand for a bit. I did Cambodia for a bit. Uh, and that was very fun. I was also on that sort of um, traveler basis. But I had some friends, and we were just, like, fucking partying, right? Like, degenerates that we are. And then when I... <laughs> Uh, yeah, same same within the four months. I was just like doing whatever, just getting really drunk, being stupid. But then when I first got uh, a job in Vietnam, that's actually where I met my girlfriend. And so we actually dated for like three years, uh, and we broke up before I moved to Mexico. It was it was amazing, you know. Uh, it was really really cool, and we like we're still good mates. Uh, but then yeah, I was single when I went to Mexico, so that was cool. <laughs> um, uh, and then now, obviously, I moved back into Vietnam. I think uh, 2000, the beginning of 2019, because I lived in Mexico for a year, and, and I've been single ever since. So it's been okay. Recently, I haven't been that active in terms of dating because I've just started this new job uh, and a huge imposter syndrome. So what I've been doing is just kind of thinking about work. Uh, and then also doing projects like this, like I kind of wanted this year to be focused on not just work, but like interest. Because I don't think, because the last last six years I've been abroad has been very work focused. I've been able to get to where I am, but then I'm like, well, hold on a minute. It shouldn't really take over your life, even though you love design. What other things uh, fulfill you as a human being, right? So I'm trying to make videos uh, as well and just doing these little fun things that like that I don't expect to be anywhere but I'm just doing it because it's fun you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but dating wise <laughs> in in Thailand right now now I'm chilling man I'm not really like doing anything yeah I'm just chilling 
Okay, I mean, yeah, that's that's the same like me. But um, <clears throat> obviously, at some point, you will think to say, like, are you that sort of person that's like, okay, by this age, I need to be married and I need to have someone? Or are you the sort of person that's just like, you know what, if it happens, it happens when I meet the right person, I will meet the right person? Or do you think what, when you get a bit more comfortable with, like, your job and your professional life <clears throat> and you think of, like, settling down, that you will eventually uh, uh, go for it? So I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've always been pretty active in dating since I moved to Asia. So, <laughs> hey, hey, <no. laughs> all good, all good. Uh, but I am, yeah, no, I'm not. I, I'm definitely not looking for someone just because of my age. I'm just feeling it out, right? Like if we enjoy our time together, that's really cool. I, I don't want to jump into anything with crazy expectations as well. So I'm, I'm quite like, you know, held back, to, but also free in the terms of, hey, I know that maybe we won't, you know, date for like three years or get married and have kids, but I'm still kind of want to explore the good relationship that we have now. So uh, I'm taking it easy and there's no expectations. I, I don't feel like marriage should be an age thing. Maybe it should just be a, a, a mindset or of both of the people that are involved. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. Are you the same? Yeah, I, I like I like that you've mentioned that because um, I feel like, look, we, we're, you know, we're still young and like, you know, I'm not saying that age is a factor to like decide when to get married or anything. I just feel like for me, it's based on meeting the right, per the, not the right person, but like someone that you, you connect with and you build with and say, hey, you know what? I think I actually want to be with this person, but it takes time to get to that stage. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I haven't even been investing time because I know like I'm not going to settle down in Zambia. Okay, so if I had to meet anyone again, which is what happened when I was in the UK, um, I, I wanted to move to, to China, for example, to work. But then I was in a relationship with a girl that I thought, okay, <clears throat> I was going to settle down with because our, our relationship was very, very strong and we were building uh, we were building it towards towards you know something serious, and she didn't want to go to China. She totally despised even the idea of going to Asia. So that kind of killed my dreams for a bit. So I don't want to find myself in a situation whereby you know I've I've always I think your concept is good where you just like go with the flow and then you know no hard feelings if like you know things don't work out the way you want to go. But like you know you enjoy the experience. Um, I haven't had that, unfortunately, and I've tried to stay away from actual like deep relationships while I've been here working because I know at the end of the day I won't be settling here. So imagine if I met a girlfriend here that's like, oh, I don't want to move to Thailand or I don't want to move to this. I don't want to move to that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, you know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't want to sacrifice like what makes me happy for what you know, makes the other person happy. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, you kind of want to focus on what you care about as well. And, and then, like, your, yeah, the, the, the timing is so also important, right, with relationships. Maybe a girl is ready to get married, but you're not, or you are ready and she's not. So everything needs to align in order yeah. for it to actually work in any sort of capacity. So that makes sense. 100%, 100%. All right, bro. Um... Where can people find you when they want to find you? Yeah, I mean, okay, Instagram is where I kind of just express my, my weird personalities. Like, I'm just open and I do anything on there. It's not extreme, it's not explicit, but it's just, yeah. Uh, it's Kanban King, so at Kanban King. But if you type in Michael Sulubani, you will be able to find me on uh, Instagram. Uh, same goes for Facebook and LinkedIn, so it's Michael M. L. Sulubani, or just Michael Sulubani. I should be the top name on the on your SEO, on your search, because, yeah, that's how much grind I put into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And I'll also link him in the show notes. I really enjoyed this chat, man, and we need to do it more. Uh, it's great to hear that you're doing well, and also great to hear that you want to visit Asia soon and, and potentially make a move out here. So I'm looking forward to that day. And yet again, any help you need, uh, I'm super happy to assist. 
Perfect. Yeah, it's it's been a pleasure, bro. It's uh, it's been a good catch up and a very good uh, chat for for the last two hours. And thank you very much for having me on uh, Ranting Bananas, man. So it's a privilege. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Cool, cool. All right. This is the Ranting Bananas, and we're out. Drop. Drop.